This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, June 28th marked the 10th anniversary since Honduran soldiers stormed into the residency of democratically elected President Manuel Zelaya and forced him on a, onto a plane to Costa Rica, ousting him from Honduras just six months before the end of his term. Since the coup, which was plotted by the Honduran military, business and political elite, and which was supported by the Obama administration, tens of thousands of Hondurans have been murdered, including more than 300 LGBTQ people, 60 journalists, and hundreds of campesino rights leaders and environmental and land protectors. One of the most devastating blows to environmentalists in the country was the brutal killing of a Lenka environmental activist and winner of the prestigious 2015 Goldman Environmental Prize, Berta Cáceres, who was shot to death in her bedroom three years ago by Honduran military intelligence specialists, with links to the country's U.S.-trained special forces. As both extreme poverty and violence skyrocketed in the last 10 years, in recent years, under the presidency of Juan Orlando Hernández, tens of thousands of refugees have fled Honduras in caravans, with the hope of political asylum in the United States. Many argue this is a humanitarian crisis caused by U.S. intervention in Honduras, as well as the U.S. government's unconditional support for Hernández. Many challenge the fairness of his reelection in 2017. Since April, tens of thousands of protesters have marched throughout Honduras, protesting plans by Honduras's government to privatize health care, pensions and education. Protesters have been met with violent repression from the Honduran military and police. The reforms were suspended, but the protests are ongoing, demanding Hernandez resign. For more, we're joined by the ousted president, Manuel Zelaya, coordinator of the Honduran opposition party Libre. He is speaking to us from Honduras, where um, he has just returned um, for this 10th anniversary of the coup that ousted him. Uh, Manuel Zelaya, welcome to Democracy Now! Can you start off by describing what happened to you 10 years ago, and then what's happening in your country, in Honduras, today? Muy bien. Un saludo a Amy. Very well. Un saludo a Democracy Now! Greetings, Amy, and greetings to Democracy Now! Democracy Now! has covered the events in Honduras very objectively, in an exemplary manner, for the last 10 years, when we began to have direct contact. Honduras is part of this region. We are neighbors of the United States. We are under the aegis of the dollar for the United States. Before, we were good neighbors. We have now become an uncomfortable neighbor for the United States because they changed their perspective on the region, on Central America and South America especially because they always used the idea that this region should be treated from the standpoint of, well, establishing democratic regimes in recent decades. Nonetheless, I think U.S. policy towards our region has changed radically. And Honduras is a special case. It would be easier for the United States, which has absolutely meddled in this country, and it has interfered in a way to support the dictatorship. It would be easier to handle the situation if there were not a military and oppressive regime with a system that impoverishes the people of Honduras, because the economic system that is uh, sealed for us by the International Monetary Fund is harmful, privatizing 
all activities. Privatization itself is not bad. What is bad is that it drives up the price of basic services for the population. Plus, since private enterprise needs profit and needs to accumulate wealth, it impoverishes the rest of the population. The uh, famous trickle-down of the capitalist system never reached our society. Here, 70 percent of the population are, is living in poverty. And the problem is that poverty continues to deteriorate, deteriorate uh, the lives of millions of people who uh, of, of thousands of people who migrate to the United States. The caravans coming from Central America are made up of persons from Honduras, also El Salvador and Guatemala, but the large caravans are uh, people going after what we know as the American dream, which has become the American nightmare. Because people go and find that the policies of President Donald Trump, who is a white supremacist, that's how we see him, he looks down on and holds in contempt mestizos and migrants. Young Hondurans, in particular, don't migrate from Honduras just because they want to, but out of necessity. There are more than one million Honduras who have family members in the United States. And if we look at it from the perspective of Honduran migrants in the United States, well, there are a million Hondurans who have close family ties with their families in Honduras. But family reunification is a crime that has no name. Nobody has chosen where they were born in this life. Even your name is given to you by your parents when you're born. And the least that we human beings should have is the right to live where we want, of course, following procedures. But now, in these conditions, I consider that militarizing society, which is what the United States has done with Honduras from the South, uh, Southern Command, and uh, the uh, the United States doesn't even have an ambassador in Honduras. It has Colonel Heidi Fulton, who is charged affair, who's been running the country for the last four years. The United States looks at Honduras merely from the standpoint of security policy. Here, if you want to characterize what is happening uh, from in terms of what the Trump administration is doing to us, we've practically gone back to the 1980s. Here there's a major campaign against communists, against those who sympathize with Chavez or the Chavistas. President Hernandez, who has usurped power uh, because he is a result of the coup d'etat, he illegitimately assumed the presidency through election fraud, two election frauds that the United States has been supporting incredibly. Even the Organization of American States, Mr. Almagro, who is a major conservative and totally pro-U.S., said that the Honduran elections should be redone. Nonetheless, Colonel Heidi Fulton came forward, the charged affairs here, and at 
a press conference with the Electoral Tribunal said there would be 5,000 uh, new uh, would be counted. Well, 70% of the Votelli sheets had been uh, collected, and with the other 20,000, they said there were 5,000 that had to be recounted, and that changed the outcome. It was a clear fraud that was supported by the United States, and this president came to power. And then he said, facelessly, the current president, who is illegal, said that the problem in Honduras is that practices of al-Qaeda were coming in. Imagine telling us that our, the opposition had Islamic tendencies and bringing in other things from the Middle East, from other conflicts. And he also blamed drug trafficking for the problems that he has. But there was an increase in drug trafficking after the coup d'etat. The Department of State says so. Uh, President Salai, you, mentioning, uh, drug, you mentioned drug yeah. trafficking. Here in the United States, most of the images that the American public receives of what's going on in Honduras is of the, the violence of the street gangs in Honduras, of the cr uh, criminality uh, in Honduras, but very little of the political repression by the government against the people. Could you talk about your perspective of how the rise of street gangs and the violence in Honduras <coughs> is linked to the coup that occurred to the corruption in the government uh, uh, th that is occurring every day in your country? Well, look, the coup d'etat inexorably it marks a new form of U.S. meddling in our society. El señor John Dimitri Negro Ponte, subsecretario de Estado. Ten years ago, John Negro Ponte, Under Secretary of State, and President George W. Bush warned me and threatened me when I was president of Honduras, saying that if I had relations with Hugo Chavez, then I would have problems with the United States. Six months after that warning, I was removed from power and removed from this country. The problem for the United States is that the friends of those who they consider their adversaries are not their friends. They've decided they're enemies of the United States, quite simply because I was seeking better relations with the South, bringing in oil from Venezuela, and getting financing for hydroelectric projects uh, with President Lula Silva, who uh, they are now holding prisoner in Brazil. So the policies of the United States towards this reason changed, and they made a mistake. And I'll talk to you about the gangs, the maras, in just a moment, your question. But if you think about the elite in the U.S. government, well, their view for this region is mistaken. They want to go back to the 1980s, which was marked by the Cold War, stigmatizing the opposition. Uh, they've uh, created shock forces, a psychological war, dirty war. Well, if they think that they're going to be able to uh, stop migration in this way, well, it's only going to worsen. The gangs are a link in the drug trafficking business, and they come about because there's no jobs, there's an excess of poverty. Poverty is misery in Honduras. Youth find no solution. So, organizations such as 
Well, then the drug trafficking organizations come on the scene, and instead of creating more jobs, the government brings more repression. Plus, uh, these are components of the dictatorship the United States is supporting. They've looted the country. Since the coup d'etat in these 10 years, each year, the United States, through the International Monetary Fund, has authorized 24 billion in, of additional debt each year. So now we have approximately $14 billion debt. When they removed me 10 years ago, we only owed $3 billion. Today it's $14 billion. So to uphold the dictatorship, first they militarized the country, then they drive the country into debt. And they uh, take out huge credits, which they call sovereign bonds, at huge interest rates. And of every 100 lempiras, 40 now go to the banks. Plus, they loot the state institutions. The levels of corruption are exorbitant. They are abusive in every sense of the word. They've looted institutions such as Social Security, which is where the retirement funds for the elderly are, and where the monies are to uh, cover the illnesses that the mothers suffer. They have looted these institutions in order to finance an unpopular, anti-democratic, and dictatorial regime. The United States doesn't talk about Honduras because it's shameful. De gobierno aquí que le da vergüenza hablar de lo que están apoyando en Honduras. They are ashamed to talk about what they're supporting in Honduras. Eh, de que el mundo lo conozca es denunciarlo. Eh, porque and uh, the only thing to do about it is to denounce it because there are murders, there are death squads. They have exported what's called Plan Colombia to uh, Honduras, the false positives, where many opposition leaders, such as uh, Berta Cáceres, to mention one, or Murillo at the time of the coup, or another person who is asphyxiated, a 24-year-old who is asphyxiated by the gases, all of these. There's no way to describe these crimes over the last 10 years other than by calling them uh, crimes against humanity. And this country should be brought before the International Criminal Court because what U.S. policy is doing is supporting genocide in Honduras and in Central America. President Salaya, I would like to ask you about another country in the region, uh, about the role of Mexico, uh, because many expected that when uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador won the presidency in Mexico, that Mexico would develop a more humane policy toward the refugees coming across its borders. What's your assessment of the first uh, uh, year, or the first several months, of uh, AMLO's presidency in relationship to your country and your situation? Mire, Andrés Manuel López Obrador. Well, look, Andrés Manuel López Obrador. I consider him to be a profoundly uh, human man with values that are in line with great moral principles for the region and for Mexico and for Central America. He has had a very clear position vis-a-vis -vis the United States. I believe that Mr. Trump's pressures against Mexico are serious when they threaten to impose tariffs on Mexican merchandise. Well, that produces more migrants, more migration, and more poverty in our region. So the policies of Mr. Andrés Manuel López Obrador are uh, practically being uh, punished by the United States. Los problemas de la migración van a buscar alguna salida en cuanto in focusing on migration they're going to look for some solution uh, to the system that is provoking the migrants because everyone talks about migration but the causes 
of migration are the U.S. policies, the uh, IMF policies, the policies of the Southern Command for this region are provoking more and more migrants with each passing day. So militarizing Central America, militarizing Honduras means that that escape valve that the Honduran people have had, which is to be able to get work in the United States. And the Honduran people haven't even looked for jobs in the United States. It is the U.S. businesses. U.S. businesses, for example, have large crops and cannot pay a U.S. person to work in the countryside. They give the uh, travel expenses to the family members of those who are their employees. And that is why there's massive migration to work in the United States. They might work six months or a year and then go back and then return. Migration is a human process seeking to find solutions. When they militarize the border, what they are going to provoke here will be greater convulsions, greater explosions, and the hundred people You've see, uh, seen this in media reports, the Honduran people are in the streets and they're protesting. And they're not protesting because we, the opposition, tell them to protest. Nobody uh, goes out to protest because some politician tells them to do so. Maybe there'd be a group of 100 people in that context, but here it's thousands of people in different parts of the country engaged in massive protests, peaceful protests. They do not use weapons. At most, the protesters might uh, mobilize in the streets, making traffic difficult, bringing transportation to a halt. But those uh, expressions of migration shows that poverty has worsened, the debt has gone up, and people are in the streets protesting because the cost of electricity, the cost of transportation, the cost of fuel. Almost everything has been privatized in Honduras, so that should be evidence that this, which is a model for neoliberal capitalism, everything is turned into a business for a small group, and for the rest there's no solution. It's a failure of Mr. Donald Trump in Central America. And then drug trafficking increases. No one wants to say so, but drug trafficking increased after the coup d'etat because the drug traffickers, when they see a country that they can control through an authoritarian system, well, they immediately get involved. Here, they found the military and the police. So, democracy is the way forward for Honduras and Central America. The United States should learn to live with democracy and not be creating repressive policies against us. We have uh, the same right that they do to be able to make a living and live in freedom. You have uh, the pre current president of Honduras, um, uh, Juan Orlando Hernandez, investigated by the U.S. government for uh, drug trafficking, and his brother, Tony Hernandez, actually arrested um, for cocaine trafficking. He was arrested in Miami. He's currently awaiting trial in this country. How does for, what does this mean um, for the people of Honduras? I mean, this is under the sí, Trump si administration that supports the current president Hernandez. Solo tiene una lectura. Well, there's only one way to read this. The United States is protecting its dictator here. Equivocadamente cree que eso le beneficia al gobierno de Donald Trump. And mistakenly, they think that benefits the government of Donald Trump. Donald Trump might win re-election in the United States. If he 
if the world sees that he's taking measures in favor of democracy in Honduras rather than in favor of the dictatorship as he is doing now. Drug trafficking is a measure of that. Drug trafficking is managed by the DEA. The DEA knows of each shipment that comes out of Venezuela and Colombia. The DEA knows about it. And some pass through without any problem and others are stopped. So there is not a fight against drug trafficking. There is a fight against cartels. There are some cartels that are fought and others they let them go. They know the implications of drug trafficking here. Nonetheless, justice is selective. They take action against some and protect the others. I think the president is protected by the United States. Ten years ago, uh, uh, before the coup against you, uh, throughout Latin America, there were progressive governments uh, trying to change the social conditions of their people. And we've seen this enormous change in Brazil and uh, in, uh, in, in your country, in the attacks in Argentina, in the attacks on uh, uh, on uh, the, the government uh, in Venezuela. What is your sense of what is happening in Latin America uh, today in terms of the movements of peoples for uh, greater social equality? Elio Ebrans lo acaba de decir en unas declaraciones que dio en el Senado norteamericano. Well, there were some statements he recently made by a U.S. senator that triumph in socialism was seen that it could set a bad example for the United States because it could even impact domestic politics in the United States. They could not allow socialism, modern socialism, I would say, because this is a socialism that is different than the socialism one found in Europe during the Cold War. This is a socialism that accepts capital, not capitalism, but capital. It accepts private enterprise, not control by capitalism of the state, because we understand the concept of popular sovereignty, where sovereignty resides in the people. Power does not reside in a military or economic elite as under the neoliberal model. So, of course, uh, for the United States, which has internal opposition, because internally in the United States there's begun uh, to be talk of democratic socialism. I've heard Democratic Party candidates talking about democratic socialism. That is why the policy of the United States towards our region has changed. And in Brazil, they went after Dilma Rousseff with a technical coup d'etat uh, because of socialist agreements with the people of Honduras and others in the region. And the right won the elections because Lula was in prison. They would not have done so if Lula were free. And now the United States not only trains military, but also judges. La utilizan como un instrumento político. Because they're using the justice system as a tool for political purposes. President Zelaya, what is your assessment of President Trump and what he's doing along the border? Es una... Yo no sé si eso le trae a él beneficios electorales. I don't know if that brings him any electoral benefit, but I consider it to be an absurd action in a globalized world in which for the last three decades we've been talking about free trade, talking about competition and competitiveness as part and parcel of the development of capitalism. And now he has come up to putting a halt to globalization. So Trump is like a negation of the historic process. He is a setback in almost every sense. But in a so in a conservative society such as the United States, that can bring him electoral benefits. But in the eyes of the world, he is behaving like a white supremacist. 
very, uh, with no human sensitivity as one would uh, require in the 21st century. Because a migration, well, migration is a right, not a crime. And the migration of the poor northward is bad, but if the migration of the inv investors southward is good. The investors come to take over the natural resources. To uh, take over like an oligopoly, and it uh, and they further impoverish our countries, and that impoverishment impoverishment produces migration, and the increase in drug trafficking, and so on and so forth. So, I see that Mr. Donald Trump's policies, with the Republican Party, represent a. Uh, setback when it comes to having Chen, good neighbor President, relations with Latin America. Of all aid to the Northern Triangle countries, to El Salvador, to Guatemala, and to your country, Honduras. This is very interesting, considering he supports Juan Orlando Hernandez, the president. Now he's backed off um, cutting that aid, but threatens to do so if uh, the immigrant flow continues. Um, do you think— uh, President Hernandez would fall without that U.S. aid? We don't need the help of the United States. The United States gives very little assistance. What the United States wants is to exercise economic control over the structures of the macroeconomy worldwide. For example, the World Bank gives Honduras some $150 million a year, $150 million. The Inter-American Development Bank, a, a similar sum. So all told, we might get about $240 million, and that is controlled by the United States. And it also has a specific weight in our region. The IMF authorizes a letter that is signed every year so that Honduras can go into debt at very high interest rates because it is a government that is allied with the United States. What that provokes in our region is clear, I think. I think it's evident what it causes in our region. I believe that that a relationship where they say they're going to cut the assistance uh, has almost no effect. Let me put it in clearer terms. Honduran migrants send to Honduras about $4 billion a year. Let me repeat this, Amy, $4 billion a year. And the United States, together with the World Bank and the IDB, sends $200 million. So, Honduras should be concerned, and the uh, current president has no dignity. We should be able to speak to the Americans on equal conditions with reciprocity and dignity. But he doesn't protest because at immigration treaty we had with the United States was canceled. We had an immigration treaty. It was renewed every year. Indeed, I had good relations with the United States. The U.S. and European oil companies don't accept competition, but they respected me. And every year, uh, they renewed TPS. Every year they renewed the Millennium Account, but this year they have not renewed a single penny of the Millennium Account. But of course, the policies threatening that aid, well, the U.S. aid, from the standpoint of hegemonic uh, control of capitalism through the transnational corporations, through businesses, uh, through the uh, control of the Southern Command over security and the IMF over the economy and the OAS, the OAS. Has supported and, or made an internal 
uh, effort on the justice system through the MACCIH. So if the justice system is controlled by the OAS, the, and uh, the uh, U.S. and monetary fund and IDB control the economy and security is controlled by the Southern Command, then... Well, th then what does Honduras run? It's all based on U.S. policy and on the interference and meddling of the United States in Honduras. We should simply reach agreement because the United States is a strong neighbor. It's the biggest military and technological power in the world. It's not that we're going to be the same as the United States, but we should not be a vassal of the United States. We are a small country, but with the same dignity as the Europeans and the U.S. have. President Manuel Zelaya, we want to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, president Zelaya was president of Honduras from 2006 to 2009. He was ousted in a U.S.-backed coup June 28, 2009, coordinator of the Honduran opposition party, Libre. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.